Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Database Talks are made possible by Ottertune. Learn how to automatically optimise your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottertune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. Thank you, thank you everyone for, for being here. We're excited today to have Joey Victor. Uh, he's a software engineer working at Single Store. Um, and so he's here to talk to us a bit about the, the, you know, so the new version of single store that deviates from the, uh, the approach that was, that it started with MemPQL. So Jojo has a master's degree and an undergraduate degree, both from Stanford. So as always, if you have any questions for Jojo, as he's giving the talk, please unmute yourself, say who you are, where you're coming from and ask questions at any time. We want to interrupt him, uh, so he's not talking by himself. So Jojo, thank you for being here. Go for it. The floor is yours. And I'll just start with the takeaway so that you could, um, we can have the takeaway. Um, the, one of the downsides of separation and storage and compute, when you, if you write one row or update one row in, in BigQuery in Snowflake, you are going to hit a blob cache and that could have random latency and high latency. Um, so I'm going to talk about a slightly different architecture, um, that doesn't do that. So you can still do transactional workloads with, um, uh, with, with the benefits of separation and storage and compute. So let's do it. Um, so the I'm going to spend most of this talk actually talking about durability, an old school replication thing. And uh, I'm going to talk about why this particular replication design makes it really easy to separate out storage and compute. And then we're going to do some applications of the fast uh, um, applications of separation and storage and compute with fast provisioning, continuous backups. And at the end, if we have time, which maybe now we won't, we can talk about some HTAP QP stuff. Um, that kind of brings everything together and shows why this architecture holistically can really do um, transactions and analytics with separation and storage and compute in one cloud native system. Um, cool. So yeah, so let's talk about durability. So the high level architecture of single store is it's a scale out database um, with essentially shared nothing partitions. So each partition has one primary replica and two or three second, or one or two secondary replicas, and the durability is managed locally on each partition. So each partition has fast synchronous replication, which I'll talk about uh, in detail, and the data is committed when it's committed in memory on each of the replicas. And the nice thing about the commit is that it doesn't touch the blob store and it doesn't touch the um, the the local disks um so everything's very fast it's in memory on three nodes you're good to go um the data is stored in an lsm tree on each partition which is fairly standard the top level is a skip list and the lower levels are htap optimized column stores uh which is how single store got its name uh, but it's it's just it's just, they're just fancy column stores um and then, of course, all the data in a partition is logged. So when you write data to the skip list, we log it row by row. And the column store data is stored in immutable data files. And if you want to update a row, we just change the metadata for that um, segment of rows. So the data files themselves are immutable. And this immutable property, that's going to be super important. Um, the fact that the blobs are immutable is the way that we're actually able to get the separation of storage and computes uh, in a way that's really reasonable and really kind of easy to think about and work with. And so finally, the data is asynchronously uploaded to a remote blob store, and we have clock SI. It's not quite clock SI. It's kind of, um, it's our own thing, but it's fairly similar to clock SI. So yeah, let's get started. Um, single store durability. I call it integrated durability in compute. Um, and I'm going to tab over, just make sure I'm still connected to you guys, which I think I am. All right, cool. Yeah, you're good. Sorry. Yeah, just a, a little uh, paranoid after what just happened. Um, OK, cool. So as I mentioned, um, we have it, each table is going to have an in-memory skip list, which is the top level of the LSM tree. So new rows, recently updated rows. We're going to have um, data file metadata. So for each of the column store files that we have, we'll store the metadata for that in memory. On disk 
is a paged log. So the log is separated into 4K pages. Um, and each of the pages gets replicated in whatever order it, um, they happen to re uh, reach the secondaries. So they can be acknowledged um, independently. So uh, short transactions don't have to wait for long transactions. And of course, we have the actual data, uh, which sits in these files that are ready to be scanned and have super fast column source scans, vectorized execution, et cetera. Cool, let's insert some data. So I insert one row. It writes the log that I've inserted that row, puts the row into the skip list. Nothing special here. I insert three rows. Um, I write a second page to the log that says I've inserted these three rows and um, puts those rows in the skip list. One nice little thing, I mentioned the replications out of order. There's no data dependency between these two pages of the log. So if the primary sent these to the secondaries in whatever order and the secondaries act them in whatever order, that's fine. Um, that's just how we keep the each you know little transaction fast, no matter what's going on. So you're you're ready to commit once you know that that chunk of the log has been hacked. All right, cool. Um, let's say that the system decides that these four rows that we have in the skip list, we're ready to make them into an actual data file. So it flushes them to disk, and the system will write two rows to the or two pages to the log. So it'll write a create data file page. And it'll write a delete from the, from the skip list. There's no more data in the skip list. Um, this create data file page is on log page three. And so that actually gives us the name of the file. Here's the file. It's file three. And it's got the, uh, it's got the rows in it. Um, and the rows are in a, a ready to scan column store format. And we also have the metadata for that file. So again, the LSN of the file is three. That's how we know the name of the file. That's how we know whether or not it's committed. And also, because we just created the file, none of the rows are deleted. So we have a little bit vector that tells us which of the rows are deleted. And it starts out with none of them deleted. So if we want to delete a row, say we delete B, um, we simply update the metadata. So we write, that to the, uh, we write that update to the log. We update it in metadata. We don't touch the file. If we want to update a row, um, we simply up. So say we want to update C2 to C7, we simply uh, update the deleted bit vector, as seen here. And we insert, so by setting the second bit, we interpret this uh, third row in the file as not being there. And we move the thing to the skip list. And I mean, obviously, this is a dramatically simplified version, but this is essentially how our durability works. You want to do uh, onesie twosie updates to the to to the column store data, you can, and we don't change the column store data. We just move the data to the skip list, and we have some fancy things around locking individual rows in the column store, which I'm not going to get into, but um, is one of our big um, technical advantages. So are there any questions about how we do durability? Yeah, well, I had a question on, you were, did, didn't you say that the log is written asynchronously and that transaction commits are independent? Um, to the allow the log is written, no, so the log, it's, the log is synchronous replication. So you need, each, each page of the log needs to be in memory on however many um, replicas you want it to be before the thing is considered committed. Yeah, I understand but, that, but, but as far as like tra this transaction one and transaction two, could, couldn't two have gotten to the three replicas before one, or do you, are you saying that two wouldn't be processed until one was committed? No, that's correct. Two could be um, sent to the three replicas before one was, um, and that would be totally fine. If okay, there was- but, Okay, so then, on. okay, I understand. That's how I understood you saying it, and then, but, but what, what about three? Three cannot be, cannot happen until one and two have made it to all the replicas. So what is it that is protecting three to have happened as well as four cannot happen until three has happened? Um, the, just like the, here we have a, a logical data dependency. The fact is that the, the flushing process can't commit on the primary until the things that it's trying to flush are committed. So those nodes, while you're waiting for the acts from the secondaries, 
you'd be um, those rows would have like row locks on them, um, or you know they wouldn't even exist yet if they haven't been sent. So, yeah. So the the the, the whatever happened like the 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 fact that the thing was able to happen on the primary um, guarantees that uh, guarantees that if the secondary uh, tries to replay what it does have. So suppose that um, two was committed, but one was not. If you fail over to the secondary, you're just going to have three, two, five. But the user would never have received an acknowledgment that one was written. On the other hand, uh, three could not have happened because the primary just didn't have access to this row. So, oh, well, I mean, so if three, you're saying three couldn't have happened, but Three doesn't seem to reference uh, A, B, C, D. So, or is that actually in the metadata of that log record for the create data file? Or uh, it's not in the it's not in the metadata. It's in the data. Yeah. The, okay. the, the process is going to like scan these things and form them into a column store file, and it's it's not going to take the ones that aren't committed. The just the iterator is not even going to see it. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, so it's it's, it's scanning the log to find out. It's scanning the skip list. Okay. Yeah, it's 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 uh, yeah. The flushing process is going to scan the skip list, and it's just not going to see things that aren't committed. Okay. And the skip list is only maintained on the primary until some kind of a takeover happens, or is that correct? Or um, the skip list will actually be replayed on the secondary, but it won't be replayed synchronously. So there's a process on the secondary that is taking whatever prefix of the log it does have and replaying it. Um, and then if there's a failover, it'll also replay whatever it has, even if there's holes in the log. Um, and so the, the skip list, is it's pinned in memory. It, it never goes away. OK, thank you. Yeah, yeah, these are great questions. Um, yeah, so the, the skip list is, is always there, and the data file metadata is always there. So the background process that's replaying the skip list is also replaying the data file metadata, including those updates to the deleted bit vector. Hi. Uh, I had maybe one more quick follow-up question, which is that I believe you mentioned that pages are replicated in whatever they, uh, they reach the secondaries in whatever order they reach the secondaries. Like, there's no guarantee. Yeah. That's right. So the secondaries are doing some kind of like buffering of their own bef before they apply the pages? Um, the pages are at a known offset. So they'll, mm. they'll, they'll write them straight to the log at the, at the correct offset. Um, and obviously the Linux, we don't f-sync though. So the Linux file system, or we don't f-sync right then and there. So the Linux, they'll be buffered by the Linux file system cache. Thanks. Cool. OK. Um, so yeah, recap. So the log is used for the manipulation of individual hot rows, but also file metadata, um, which is kind of funny, but that's, that's the way it is. Um, bulk data is stored in column store data files, um, which are immutable. Um, and the data is committed when it's replicated um, in memory to a handful of nodes. And the replication is lock free and out of order, so it's super fast, low latency, predictable latency. Um, and I haven't said anything about cloud storage yet. So the right latency is low and it's predictable. Um, cool. All right. So let's now actually talk about how to make this um, classical structure into a modern structure. So we already have this highly durable, low latency store in which all the data is recorded in a single log for, for a single partition. And we can easily copy this data to a remote blob store. Simply, uh, after a data file is committed, you upload that data file. Every minute or so, you upload whatever tail of the log in a log chunk. And you periodically upload a checkpoint file. Um, which just has all of the known data file metadata in it and all of the in-memory rows in it. And only the primary replicas have to checkpoint. Of course, our checkpointing process is very simple. 
you simply scan the skip list, you scan the metadata, and you serialize it into some format, and you upload it. There's no merging of B trees. There's no none of this nonsense. It's all just taking something in memory and serializing it. Um, OK, so the nice thing about this is like S3 has 11 nines of durability. So any data file that's at an LSN below what's so we're, we're uploading things in, in the LSN order. And any data file at an LSN lower than what's uploaded could simply be deleted from local disk. Or to say another way, the local disk is just a cache now. And um, once something is below that LSN, you can evict it from the cache because you know you can just download it from uh, remote storage. And so we say that the storage is bottomless um, because you can just keep loading and loading and loading. And as long as your queries are mostly staying within a working set, everything still works. Are there any questions here? What does your cache eviction policy look like in, in this case? Like, is it sort of this trade off between cost and, and performance? Because every S3 yet it costs you money. Yep. Uh, so you obviously don't want to. You don't want to churn the cache. Yeah. It, it costs you time more than it costs you money. S, S, if, because the our service runs in EC2, so we don't have to pay for the actual um, number of bytes, but we do have to pay per the API call. But because these blobs combine multiple columns, and there's some heuristics to see which columns should be in which, you know, um, combined, right? Um, the number of Git requests is actually fairly small, um, where, like, it, a thirty-two node, uh, a, a thirty-two node machine that's doing like a pretty aggressive, like a workload that doesn't have a working set and is constantly churning the cache, um, costs about two dollars a day worth of Git requests. Okay. Uh, so like, it's not free because you can have a lot of nodes, but like, yeah, S three is cheap. Um, but yeah. the time is just horrible. If you have to download a lot of data from S three, um, you're looking at you know, I don't know, hundreds of milliseconds per fetch. It, it, so that part of it is bad. Um, so anyway, to, to answer your question, we use LRU2. Um, and in certain cases, we'll just store the thing in memory instead of storing the thing on disk. Um, but, you know, so like if I do one scan, it doesn't totally destroy your cache. But yeah, it's... Um, this is a really subtle problem, and we are still working on tuning it. Um, so okay. this is like a very active area of of uh, development right now. No, I, but I think that the most important thing out of this is that you said that the cost is you don't care. It's, it's really performance still, even though you're paying for a get call. Who get like who cares? Yeah, I believe it's half a cent per thousand Git requests. Um, yeah. A thousand Git requests is. Um, 32 gigabytes, which, you know, I don't know, half a cent per 32 gigabytes is not crazy. Yeah, okay, that's fair. Um, cool, okay, yeah. So um, what what are the benefits of separation of storage and compute? Um, well, they're the same as the benefits for, um, you know, for our competitors. You can store more data than you have local disk. You can turn off the cluster when it's not in use because, you know, you can just provision from this thing. Another cool thing is you can do fast provisioning. So um, to provision a new replica, all you have to do is replay the snapshot and whatever log chunks come after it. You don't have to download the, um, you, you don't have to download any of the data files. You obviously have to download the data files if you want to run queries, but in order to just get up and running, get ready to serve redund you know serve acts for redundancy, you don't really need anything. So and 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 the the snapshot files and the log chunks are small relative to all of the um, data files. You can also burst reads, and you're only going to have to download the files that you're actually going to read. Um, and if you're a little bit careful about it, you can burst writes. And of course, by moving all of the data to one place, you have automatic continuous backups and point-in-time restore. 
11 nines of durability. The thing's not going anywhere. It's awesome. So you never have to think about taking a backup again. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how we do that as well. Um, so, 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 so these are the benefits that uh, that we have, and Snowflake and BigQuery have, and Aurora has. Uh, if you have a separation of storage compute, you get these things, and it's cool. And if your database doesn't, it's not a modern database, in my opinion, or at least not 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 in the cloud. Like I just think this this stuff is uh, table stakes, and it's also vaporware for single store. We don't have it read, uh, generally available yet, so I'm kind of you know, making fun of myself a little bit. But um, yeah, I think this stuff's a big deal. What are the benefits of single store though? Well, you have um, low predictable latency um, and it's resilient to temporary blob store outages. So if my blob store goes away for 10 minutes, um, which it's allowed to do because it doesn't have that many nines of availability, I can keep writing because the writes only talk to the cluster. Um, if, you know, I can't, read data that's not in my local cache. That's the only bad thing that happens. Uh, super easy to handle bursts in the workload. Um, I have unique, I can do unique key constraints because we don't have multi-master. That's kind of, uh, Snowflake, you can write from anywhere, but like the writes have to take all these global locks and it's, it's a little bit more complicated. And it, I just think that this design is really easy. Um, yeah. Uh, of course, the trade-off is only one cluster is writable. You can have readable secondaries, but only one writable secondary. And if you lose an entire region, then you will lose data. Um, so the advantage of, oh, I committed the row, it's in S3, you will never, ever, ever lose data. Um, any questions here? Cool. All right. Um, all right, application, fast provisioning. Um, so I talked a little bit about fast provisioning, but um, I'll talk a little bit more. So the question is, what do you actually need in order for a replica to come online? Well, you need all the data file metadata, and you need all of the in-memory rows, all the rows in the skip list. So provisioning a new replica is really easy. You just download the checkpoint, whatever log chunks come after it, and replay it. Um, and then you can just replicate the live data from wherever the current primary is. Um, and so like, this is an operation that can happen in seconds to minutes rather than downloading many terabytes, which would take longer. Um, so if I want to provision something to uh, do redundancy, well, I literally just provision it and it's ready to act writes. If I want to burst reads, I have to download the new working set and then I'm ready to run reads. It's a little bit tricky to burst write. It's trickier to burst writes, but you can still do it. Um, all you have to do is reshuffle your partitions. So if suppose you have 100 partitions across 10 nodes, you could split that to 100 partitions across, across 20 nodes just by spin up 10 new nodes, provision new secondaries there, preheat the cache, and then fail over. If you don't preheat the cache, you, um, you will your workload will stop working after uh, w after the failover. What, what what is the definition of like burst reads, burst writes? Like what do you, what what does that term mean to you? Um, so the uh, so bursting reads. Um, I do not. What I do not mean. Okay, okay, that's a really good question, uh, and that's a really polite way of saying, um, hey, if like one query comes in that's a little bit slow, this isn't going to work. Um, so it's more like, oh, I have this dashboard that I want to create. And so I'm just going to create a whole new set of partitions and this dashboard is going to run. Or, oh, I know that for the next hour, this analyst is going to be like playing with some data and they just want to be able to run whatever queries they want to run. Cool. Spin up a new thing. Um, and you can, uh, you know, the scale is pretty much indefinitely. You can have hundreds of these secondary, um, re uh, readable secondaries, if you want. Um, what it does not do is minute by minute scaling. Yeah, so you mean like, so there's some provision you can do ahead of time, within, you know, maybe not on a per minute basis, but like with some a lot of time, the idea is you could spin up a 
a new partition or a new set of partitions that services one application away from the main the main store. That that's right. Yeah, okay. it, it's 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 more akin to Snowflake's warehouse. It, it's yep. just Snowflake warehouses. It's like got it. The same thing. Yep. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, bursting rights. It's more like oh, there's just like it's, you know, it's six o'clock. Everyone just turned on their TVs. What you know, whatever it is. Um, are there any other questions about fast provisioning? Uh, hi, sorry. Quick question: Why do you need to warm up the cache for rights? Um. So the reason you need to warm up the cache for rights is because writes can only happen on the primary cluster. If the primary cluster isn't doing very many reads, then you don't have to wor uh, warm up the cache. But the assumption is that there's some workload happening on the um, on the primary set of partitions that you, you wouldn't want them to suddenly all have a cold cache at the same time. Um, so it's it's also true that like let's say I, I have just redundancy two I've got one primary one secondary, but the secondary like isn't you know no one's querying the secondary so so the secondary's cache is cold. If the primary dies and I do a failover, whatever workload was running on that primary is just going to grind to a halt because it has to down you know it has to download however much local disk um, that the primary had. Um, so actually, even our redundancy secondaries. They do best effort to keep the cache in sync with the primaries, um, or they, they get stats from the primaries because you don't want to like use up the, you know all that much space, but you want it to be like warm, even if it's not like super hot. Um, does does that answer your question? Yep, got it. Thanks. Is it really availability if after the failover you have to download you know 100 terabytes? Like that's that's kind of that's kind of what's what's up. So it's you know it's asynchronous, it's best effort, but most of the time when you fail over, you're not gonna your workload's not gonna be pillaged. All right. Um, hey, Julio, question on that. Yes. You were just saying that in replication, we we do our best to replicate to the secondary as well. I thought that only data replicates. It sounds like you're saying the plan cache replicates, uh, or what exactly? How's that done? Um, it's it's not the plan cache. It's it's just the um, the the blob cache. Um, uh, it doesn't replicate. There's just like a little heartbeat that says like, hey, I noticed these blob. Like, it just gives you statistics on the blobs. Hey, these files are hot. You might want to keep them around because no one's querying the secondary, so the secondary doesn't know what um, files are hot. Okay. Cool. Thanks. And again, the main reason that you do this is for availability. Um, because something that's queryable but slow is not particularly available. Um, how much time do I have? Uh, you have like uh, 17 minutes. 17 minutes? Great. All right, cool. Um, so I'm just going to finish up by talking about some loose ends. Um, so this is really a talk about storage. But I, I just want to talk about our, our query layer and some of the query features that, that we have that make single store really unique. And um, you could dedicate entire talks to them, but um, we just don't have time. And there, there are features which uh, also let you do transactions and analytics in the same system. So, um, if you, so of course, we have a scale out cluster. And you have many shared nothing partitions on several hosts. So one of the issues that you have, uh, oh, before I, I, I talk about the, the QP features, I, I wanted to talk about um, more storage features. I'm sorry. Um, so all of the logs in LS, uh, LSN's uploads, that all happens independently. So an LSN on one node could be different than an LSN on another node. And um, so what we do is the tra each transaction is given a logical timestamp. And it's inspired by um, clock SI. Um, and so the timestamps can be used to find an LSN in each partition. So you get a whole bunch of LSNs 
that allow a user to restore the cluster to a consistent state, right? I was like, OK, I have you know, all the data ever for each, um, for, for each partition, but I want all the partitions to be at the, at the state that they were at a very specific time. And so this allows you to do that, down to making sure which transactions in, which transactions out. Um, these timestamps can also be used to run snapshot isolation transactions. And we use 2PC to maintain um, atomicity for multi-partition transactions. Um, so this really is kind of the, from a, the transactional perspective, this is a, um, uh, uh, an ACID database. We, we've, got, we, we, we've got each letter, and it actually works. Um, we also have a bunch of really cool QP features, which are used um, to give us you know, both transactions and analytics in one system. So each table has an optional sort key uh, and an op uh, optional shard key. We have secondary hash indexes on our column sort tables, um, which you know, is cool because it allows you to seek to an individual row. Um, we also allow locking of e individual rows one at a time, even if they're in those column sort segments. So you can scan, you can use the hash index to find a row, scan right to it with our SQL encodings, lock the row, and we even have unique hash indexes. Uh, some things are still going to suck. You want to do an upsert, you're going to have to like jump all over the universe, you know, decoding each of the different, um, each of the different columns. But like you want to just get a unique key constraint, insert ignore, or even just replace a row. Um, these things can all happen super fast. And if you combine these facts with the facts that the hottest rows tend to stay in the skip list, our single stores column store can perform kind of within an order of magnitude of a row store database on point right transaction workloads, uh, which I was pretty shocked to hear that this all kind of came together and worked. But we've got benchmarks of us running um, TPCC and, you know, OK, obviously it's not as fast as row store, but it's only like 10 times slower. Um, and I thought that was like, pretty cool. Um, so are there any questions on the last two slides? I guess I would add, you sort of set yourself up. Why is it 10x lower? Column store, like, I, like are you competing against Postgres MySQL running on a single box? Like, what's the, what was the uh, comparison? Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, yes. Um, single store has uh, full row store tables. Um, which essentially just means everything's in the skip list. And if you pin everything in the skip list, then in addition to the things always being hot, um, you also don't have to like you know open those those column store secondary indexes. And so you don't even if you like want to do do a unique key check, you just you know, you just check it on the skip list. It's gonna be crazy fast. Um, like yeah, I. I have seen Andy, Andy post on Twitter some comparisons of um, select skip lists and BW plus trees and stuff like that. But um, that's my next question. But we can take it now. Why? Like, like you guys rewrote the whole engine going from the row store to the column store, the, the, the single store, like this back when the still called them people. Why did you keep the skip list? Uh, we kept the skip list so that the hot rows stay hot. But you could have done that with the B plus tree. Um, I, uh, with all due respect, I think that your skip list is not as good as our skip list. But that's fair. OK. <laughs> Actually, yeah. you know, it wasn't our skip list. It was the Australian skip list. We found that like that was the list is the best one in academia. Mm. So that, that we, we can take offline. I'm, I'm curious. I mean, like, so yeah. did you do? Did you do internal best? I mean, this is not the point of the talk, but like, did you guys do internal benchmarking, say, like, oh, should we should we consider a B plus tree? Um, no, I mean, our skip list is like pretty simple. Um, we 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 do have uh, an engineer that has written a BW plus tree at uh, Microsoft, um, and he he swears that they're better, but everyone they're knows they're more complicated. Yeah. yeah um, I, I, no, no, so that, that's a BW tree. I don't recommend that. I'm saying, but uh, 
a good solid B plus tree, at least the literature suggests that, not just mine, other things, that the, the, the B plus tree apple clones skip lists. I mean, there's other things you have to worry about in your system. It's only one facet of it. I was just curious, like, okay, let's go build the entire thing. Uh, you know, and we're building a whole new engine. Let's consider maybe looking at a skip list or something alternative than a skip list. And then someone posted into the simu skip list double linked. So again, it is not our skip list. We found it from this guy in Australia that was listed as the best skip list that was open source. Yeah, yeah, that I was, I it, it was years ago, but I was like, is, was this the guy with the double link skip list? Like, yeah. Um, and, it, and it wasn't towers, it was wheels. It was some Australian thing. Yeah. Um, I, I think that it just kind of like most of, so most data is going to be in the column store segment. Most people uh, that have, you know, these huge data sets. Um, the in-memory part just has to be fast enough for these point workloads to be like a bajillion times faster than the column store. You want one row, like you, you're not gonna, you're not gonna beat these these very simple data structures. That's fair. No, it's, and then, and then if you if you're gonna be scanning it a lot, like a column store is just better for scans, you know. So, like um, the skip list is just absolutely terrible for scans, but you don't scan it, and it's okay. Okay. So. Right, sorry, is this going to talk? We, we can open up to, to the questions of the audience if you're done or if you have more slides you want to go through. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I'm, uh, I have one more important. Okay. Yeah, uh, so, okay. So, conclusion um, we got benefits of sorting compute, integrated durability uh, means we're not sacrificing transactional latency. Uh, our query processing feature set lets us do the point workloads and the hybrid column store table uh, without sacrificing scan performance because the scans happen on the column store. And so it's a good candidate for an HF database. And the most important slide, we are hiring. Um, so awesome. now questions. Awesome. So I, I will applaud and have everyone else. Sorry, my, my, I had written down for, about the skip list question. I was saving it to the end, but you kind of like jumped into it. Uh, mm -hmm. So, OK, we'll open up to the audience if anybody has any questions. So uh, hi, I'm Lin. Uh, thanks for the nice hey. talk. I have a a little bit of maybe higher level or from the application perspective mm -hmm. question, which is, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, it's uh, you have a synchronous uh, replication, but then you will commit the data as long as I mean the data reaches uh, in memory on replicas, right? Instead of waiting mm -hmm. for app sync to finish, uh, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm wondering, just wondering from a application perspective, have you um, ever faced a little bit maybe concern from the customers saying that? Hey, my data has not reached disk yet. What if I mean more than half of the replica just gotten like a down? I mean, has, has your customer any have any have any have ever faced any pushback from the customers kind of thing? Um, yeah, so that's just the default. We also support sync durability, and some of our customers do use it. Um, it just depends on how par uh, paranoid people are. Oh, so then I'm actually a quick follow up. Pretty curious. Do you know maybe how much of your customers are using the uh, I mean, synchronous uh, uh, durability one, or versus how much are using the asynchronous one? Which is pretty curious. Uh, async is the default, so I'm going to guess like 99% of people use async. I'm only aware specifically of one customer that does sync durability. Okay, interesting. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Uh, I guess I have another question. Of you mentioned at the start of the talk that like. You started off with fast synchronous replication, but so you also have the synchronous replication. So I guess you said most of your customers use asynchronous durability by default. So suppose I'm running something like TTCC with asynchronous durability. What kind of performance hit will I see with like synchronous replication as opposed to async replication? Um, I think that I we have definitely done that experiment. And um, so, so sync versus async is like almost nothing. It's like five to ten percent. Um, like, I think on TCC, TPCC, it might have been indetectable, but don't quote me on that. Um, like, our sync replication is basically as fast as our async replication. Um, I think durability was like a bit slower, like noticeably slower, but not like ten x slower. Maybe just a bit slower. Um, but I can't give you the numbers. Um, I, I I could find the numbers and follow up. 
Uh, just to follow up, when you say it's not 10 times slower, you mean throughput, not latency, right? Uh, I mean, both. I mean, the latency, because, uh, you know, we're... yeah, I think the throughput is like identical and the latency is like 10% slower or something. But how is that? So from, from personal experience, I feel like S3 is going to be orders of magnitude larger latency when it comes to commit, right? The commits never touch S3. So, so what do you mean by synchronous, like synchronous durability then if it, if it doesn't draw the line at S3? Uh, synchronous replication means that you have acts from um, as many nodes as you need. So in, the, in this experiment, it was just two nodes. So you have acts from one node. That's sync replication. Sync durability means you're on disk on two nodes. And then the replication to S3 is always asynchronous. We, we never um, do sync replication a, to S3 because it would just, it, it, we don't have any advantage okay. there. And, um, so, uh, so, yeah, sorry, go ahead. So the durability is managed by the cluster. Um, you have live nodes that, that are managing the durability. And the, um, if you lose one node, who cares? If you lose the whole, if you lose a whole region, you're going to lose data. Um, so that's bad. Okay, but, I guess. But in this case, so just to get, just to be clear on your storage hierarchy, you have in-memory, which is not obviously not volatile, uh, volatile, and you have S3, which is presumably very durable. So what role does local disk play here? Because you seem to assume that if the region goes out, local disk data is gone. But um, like. Basically, is it basically just slower, more a cheaper main memory at that point? Why does there have to be a special level for it? Um, yeah, actually, like uh, we have we have discussed um, literally considering all disks to just be like uh, you know just a cache, right? Like disks are a hell of a lot cheaper than than memory, and sequential scans of disks are. Mm -hmm. Plenty fast. Um, so, like, yeah, you got these local SSDs, and it's essentially, it, yeah, it's essentially just a cache. Yeah, but but somehow you seem to be differentiating local disk when it comes to durability when you mention synchronous durability. Yes, unless you turn on synchronous durability. But okay. um, in, in the cloud, in the cloud, um, I'm kind of assuming that if you lose a node, you're losing everything. All right. I, I'm not counting on. Um, I'm not counting on, for instance, Kubernetes to put my pod back in next to the same right. disk. So it, it really is for the paranoid, not not that it has much uh, practical use. Well, we 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 um, we used to sell databases on prem, and in fact, we still do. Okay. Um, Got it. Yeah, the vast majority of our business is on prem today. Got it. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, th this technology, I'm hoping, will be generally available like in this summer. But none of this technology um, 